Thank you for joining us on the Serpents and Doves podcast. This is a Reformed confessional podcast of two Baptists that want to help God's people who have been sent out into this world to fulfill Jesus' command to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We discuss the questions of culture to help Christians give an answer. In 1673, Port Dartmouth, England. A lusty 23-year-old man lay wallowing in his own blood from self-inflicted wounds to his throat and stomach. He had just sailed from Virginia to Dartmouth, a town located on the southwestern corner of England. During the voyage, he had become severely depressed and sought to take his own life. A few days after arriving to port early on a Sunday morning, the young man took a knife, cut his throat, and not thinking it would kill him quickly enough, stabbed himself in the stomach. His brother was sleeping in the same room. He awoke and immediately called for a physician. The physician arrived to find him only too far gone. Notwithstanding, he stitched up the young man's throat and applied a plaster over the gash to his stomach. And it was in this condition that John Flavel, the Puritan pastor of Dartmouth, found him. Surmising that the young man was within minutes of eternity, Flavel labored to assess the spiritual condition of his heart. I have little time to do anything for you, Flavel told him. Do you have any apprehensions of where you stand before God? The young man, with almost unintelligible speech due to the wound in his throat, proceeded to tell the pastor that he trusted in God for eternal life. But Flavel didn't believe him. Something about the man's response or the failed suicide attempt tipped Flavel to become greatly concerned about the eternal state of his soul. Instead of being content with his statement of faith, Flavel pressed him all the more. He records what happens next. The young man began to lament with many tears his sin and misery, and asked me if there might yet be hope for one that had destroyed himself and shed his own blood. I replied, the sin is indeed great, but not unpardonable. And if the Lord gave him repentance unto life and faith to apply to Jesus Christ, it should certainly be pardoned to him. Writhing in pain from his wounds, the man cried out to God to have mercy upon his soul, asking his newfound friend and pastor to pray with him. The next morning, Flavel visited the young man, was surprised to find him still alive. Amazingly, after several surgeries, he survived. Flavel later wrote, So it was that both the deep wound in his throat and in his stomach healed, and the more dangerous wound sin had made upon his soul, I trust, was effectually healed also. What kind of pastor would be so concerned for the eternal state of a dying man that he wouldn't be content with a simple profession of faith? Most people today, even pastors, would probably be content enough to hear some small comment of church attendance or Bible reading so as to be able to tell people at the funeral, he's in a much better place. But Flavel was not that kind of pastor. He cared too deeply for people's souls. So who was John Flavel? Not a normal beginning to the Serpents and Doves podcast. Welcome back with us today. So glad to be with you as we have a fun discussion about the Puritans and John Flavel. And so I'm joined today by my co-host, Frank Butler, and by Pastor Reagan Marsh. Reagan serves as senior minister at Rocky Face Baptist Church, been in the ministry for 20 years, and been serving at his current church for quite a few years now, and we are so glad to have you on. So Reagan, what were you just reading? I was reading from Brian Cosby's book, John Flavel, Puritan Life and Thought in Stuart, England. And you just had us on the edge of our seats in this office. How powerful that was. Frank, is that any different than the modern way we minister to people? Extremely different. For one, you use the words repentance. Uh, you there, yes. <laughs> you use the words sin. You didn't accept just the simple, yes, I believe. I know where I'm going to go. You, Flavel did not just accept that as we're good to go. High five to you. Enjoy the kingdom. Flavel was deeply concerned about that man's soul. How powerful. What a contrast to the way we normally think of Puritans as prudes, as self-righteous, as cold and mechanical. That was a loving and faithful man and came back and checked on him the next day. Yes. So today we talk about the Puritans and Reagan, you love the Puritans. And so we wanted to have you on today. You're down here in Pensacola preaching a conference at our church this week on spiritual focus yep. focusing on mark chapter 7 in the heart which makes it sound like you might be a modern puritan yourself <laughs> i hope to i hope to become one there we go so tell us a little bit about why you started reading the puritans and why they matter to you well my father-in-law was reading the puritans before they were cool uh, when kara and i were still dating we, we were not even engaged yet our first christmas together he gave me a little booklet by don kistler 
entitled Why Read the Puritans Today? And that kind of started me on my quest. I went on to read Pilgrim's Progress, which I know Frank you'll appreciate. I do. And over time, they began to make sense to me. I, I remember when we were at Southern, Sean Wright would read a portion of Thomas Watson's Body of Divinity uh, before every class. And it was like water to my soul. And so just one book followed the other, followed the other, followed the other. And they have been my constant companions for probably the last 10 to 12 years. Excellent. So let's set a little precedence. There's some people listening today and they love the initial story and now they've been lost the last three minutes. So who are the Puritans? Frank, you want to fill us in a little bit and then Reagan? The Puritans were those who sought to purify the church from staying within. They sought to make the necessary changes while maintaining the doctrine that they believed to be true and therefore maintain purity within the church. I would add that some of these changes they saw were in no way minor because in the in the context of the Church of England, you're looking time frame is, I take J.I. Packer's dates, about 1550 to 1700. Um, I would throw Jonathan Edwards in there. He's a Puritan born out of due time. And that's because Packer was around in that time period. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played. But they were seeking, as you said, to reform the Church of England. But where they were in that time, the Book of Common Prayer was a wonderful document. It was Calvinistic in its nature. But then there was also the requirement of the surplus. And there was the vowing to receive the sacrament, or kneeling rather, to receive the sacrament all of these things which they saw as holdovers from Roman Catholicism, and I think rightly so. So in their mind, the church was only halfway reformed, and they saw this as an affront to the right worship of God. So the name Puritan came about because they were just too concerned. It was, it was originally a term of derision. It's important to point out that many of the Puritans did not just simply walk out of the Church of England. The, the Great Ejection happened, a very important event in history. And they were, 1662, they were forced to be removed from their congregations. And this was a, a brutal day. One historian said it was the darkest day in England's history, as many faithful and godly pastors were removed from the Anglican Church. Now, not all the Puritans were Anglicans, and that's no. important to point out as well. And I know, Frank, who's your favorite Puritan? The great Baptist, John Bunyan. <laughs> yes. So why is Bunyan your favorite Puritan? You're always quoting something from Bunyan, and I know you like his poetry and such, but what, what is it about Bunyan that intrigues you? Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. That book, it's his, it's his autobiography. It's, it's about you know, his change, his repentance, his growth in Christ, his life. Um, I read that, and it resonates with me. Amen. Um, his struggle of regeneration. Have I been regenerated? Have I not been regenerated? Do I believe? Do I not believe? Hearing people speak about uh, their faith in a way that he had never heard before in the context he had grown in and believing, well, if that's how people talk about how they love their Lord, then I apparently don't love them at all. And that book alone is what made him my favorite Puritan yeah. to read from. And then his poetry, it's like music to my ears. It's wonderful. He was definitely a man who went through great suffering he was very human. And so if you're going through suffering, struggles, I have a picture in my office behind me of a picture of Bunyan with his blind daughter visiting him in prison mm. and how uh, tender he was to her in prison. And so these are men that really had struggles like you and I have today, if not much worse. And so we want to talk a little bit about John Flavel because Reagan, you really introduced me to Flavel and his writings and were kind enough to give me some books of his, and I've had the privilege to read some Flavel, and I know you've read him deeply, so tell us who was John Flavel. As we said, he was a fellow who was born 1630 to 1691, pastor, husband, theologian, sufferer, and also one of the ones who was a victim of the Great Ejection, uh, August 24, 1662. So let's put it this way. Jonathan Edwards quotes Flavel more than anyone else in all of his works combined. Anthony Wood was a contemporary of Flavel, and he said this, Flavel had more disciples in his life than ever had John Owen the Independent or Richard Baxter the Presbyterian, and yet we've forgotten this guy. When you read his stuff, his writings are warm and pastoral, they're experiential, they, they just, they touch the soul, they counsel you. 
lot of people excelled in personal work, um, but he is also an amazing theologian. You look at him and you realize this guy's an exegete. He was fluent in eight languages, at least. And eight languages, big deal. Yes. Yeah. I speak King James and modern English, so. Congratulations. I barely speak modern English. There you go. <laughs> He, he studied at Oxford. Uh, he buried three wives and a son. So he was very acquainted with suffering, very familiar with the, the pains and sorrows of his people. He was, as we said, ejected. Uh, and then a couple of years later, the Five Mile Act came because Flavel and many of the other Puritan pastors had been slipping back into their towns to have meetings. And so the Five Mile Act came which was where upon pain of imprisonment and or death, you could not come back. If you had been one of these pastors rejected, you could not come back within five miles of your town. And Wait, I wanna hear more about that, but we've gotta take a break. So hold on to your seats. We'll be right back on Serpents and Doves. We are back on segment two. So Reagan, you were just talking about the Five Mile Act. Please continue and fill us in a little bit about some of the things Flavel had to go through. After the Great Ejection, many of the Puritan pastors would come, they would slip back into town and they would hold services for their people. And so you can actually see, for example, in Dartmouth at the main church, they took role by name, you would have the, the pew register. And there were weeks where the church was almost empty. And it appears that the people were going out of town to hear Flavel preach because he could not preach in town. But that five mile act was intended to deprive as completely as possible these pastors of their ministry. Archbishop Laud was incredibly brutal incredibly vindictive towards these men and so he did everything in his power to cast them out but the five mile act was if they came near to their town if they came in they would be imprisoned and or executed there were a number of them who that did happen to them so we often think of the puritans as having prim and proper prudish perfect lives was that enough alliteration for you nice oh you're a baptist preacher Shh. And um, that being the case, we often just romanticize the Puritans. But the Puritans had a lot of struggles, yes. a lot of suffering. There were some blind spots in their theology Absolutely. we might want to talk about. But I'd like first for you to kind of speak to some of the, the pain, the persecution. I know there's a, a kind of unique story about Flavel having to dress as a woman. Tell us a little bit about like what he had to go through, some of these things that many christians in our country have never we think like we're being persecuted if someone takes our parking spot at walmart and you know we we pray imprecatory prayers against somebody because they beat us to the spot that's our version of persecution or because today as we're speaking people are pulling monuments down to confederate generals and christians are outraged that we're being persecuted as if that has anything to do with our faith but let's talk about real persecution. The Puritans help us classify exercises and missing the point a lot more clearly. He was very faithful in his personal ministry. And so he would go still visiting his people house to house under cover of night. He would travel and in those visits, they would be catechesis, they would be uh, counseling, they would be the well, Let's the back up ministry. for a minute, yeah. help out our listeners. Catechesis. He would be teaching his people the catechism, the Westminster Catechism. So he wasn't taking care of their cats. He no, was catechizing. No, he's, he's yeah, catechizing. Yeah, yeah. He's giving them the doctrinal content of the Christian faith and life so that they would have a framework within which to live their lives and to view their world. So he was very faithful in that. That, that's been a, a wonderful thing to see. I, I had to interrupt yeah, just because ahead. a lot of pastors, you know, they have to go pray for people's cats in the modern church. So I yes, yes. just wanted to clarify that's yeah, so important. I, I, some have to go bless them, you know. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, that was a cheap shot. They've gotten the, the pet blessing down pat because they can't fill their pews with converts. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's continue. laughs> but Flavel would go travel at points in disguise. And at one time he did disguise himself as a woman 
in order to uh, get to one of his destinations. Another time he was preaching, there was a, a point uh, there in their town, it was a port city, and so there was a point where there was this huge slab of rock that would come uh, open when the tide was out. And so that became a popular place for him to meet his people. It was just outside of the, just outside of that range, but that didn't prevent the authorities from pursuing him there. And so one time he was preaching there, the authorities showed up to arrest him. He jumped on his horse and took off riding across the beach and outran them. It looked like something out of a movie. Uh, another time he was preaching in an upper floor of a home. Authorities came in and his people literally pushed him. Uh, some some say out the door, some say out the window. I can't. I, I, I'm not sure which, but they, they get him out of the house. One of his good friends, uh, one of the leaders in their church, was trying to escape, but he was too much of a gentleman. And so he allowed a lady to go down the stairs first. The lady took her time with her dress. That sounds and about right. The, <laughs> the lady let, took her time. Frank, I hope your wife is listening right now. I'm sure she will. I was just thinking <laughs> Julia will have words for you, my friend. <laughs> she took her time. His friend was arrested and wound up dying in prison as a result of it. Wow. So wow. There, is, there is some context for standing on eternal truths and saying... This is not a kumbaya, let's all just hold hands and get along. This is saying truth matters and the glory of God matters and it will be costly and it's worth it. Wow, what's sobriety and gravitas to think about these things. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. We've got a lot more good stuff for you. Welcome back to Serpents and Doves. This is segment three, talking about the life, ministry, and theology of John Flavel with Pastor Reagan Marsh. So, Reagan, right off the bat, I'm a, I'm a book nerd. Yes. Um, I try to read about a book a week. Pastor Josh is the same way. I, you probably read seven or eight books a week. I'm a slow um, reader. <laughs> <laughs> what books of Flavel, right off the top of your head, would you say are the must-read for the Christian life? Definitely The Fountain of Life. Um, it is the subtitle of a fountain of life is a display of Christ in his mediatorial glory. So it's a puritanical subtitle. It is a puritanical subtitle and it is amazing. It is rich. He goes through and shows how Christ is glorious, how Christ is, there is life in him. And 17 or 18 times in that book, he ends, it's just a series of sermons. But 17 or 18 times in that book, he ends with, Blessed be God for Jesus Christ. And you are left, as you as you finish reading those sermons, you're left thinking, Yes! Your heart is singing. He is lovely. And Christ is all. Fountain of Life is definitely one. Another one, I know, I know that some pastors will be listening to this. He has one called The Character of an Evangelical Pastor Drawn by Christ. And it's not a lengthy work. But he deals with how a pastor should treasure the gospel and how he should live and exercise his ministry in light of that. So very timely. But those are those are probably two of if, if you're looking for where to dip in, that's where I'd start. With our last couple minutes left, I do want to ask you about just some of Flavel's words. I know that often I will get a text message from you with some juicy John Flavel quote, which is always exciting to receive. Not like the normal texts I get on a day-to-day -day basis, so <laughs> they definitely stand out and are refreshing to the soul. So do you have any quotes that stand out to you on your mind that you would like to share? Before you answer that, you quoted Flavel on the Puritan board extensively at one point, and I read through it and was like, this is great, this is phenomenal, and I hit the like, I think it was, I forget exactly what the terminology is for the Puritan board, and I shared it on Facebook, and didn't even realize it was you until after I did it, it was like, pretty funny. <laughs> I, I just, just blew up one of my good friends, and didn't even realize it was him, so. There are literally so many, y'all were y'all were laughing at me a, a minute ago about how I write in my books, how I underline, you know, and Kara, Kara often teases me, it would be easier for me to highlight the parts that I didn't like. Um, <laughs> So, so it's, it's very difficult to narrow down, but probably my favorite, he says at one point that in giving Christ, God gave the richest jewel in his cabinet, 
heaven itself is not so valuable as is Christ. That encompasses Flavel's ministry. Everything that he does is to show the majesty and glory of Jesus Christ. Everything that he does is to show his value and to show his exceeding beauty. And he is a man who lived and breathed and ate and drank Christ. And when you put him in the context of the suffering, of the loss, of the persecution, um, his own father was ejected when Charles II came back as a king. He was a Presbyterian minister and was, was imprisoned along with his mother. And then they died of the plague as a result of that a few years later. You put, you put all that together and you have a snapshot of a man who knows what it is to abide in Christ. And he's, he's not some superhuman, super spiritual giant in the sense that, that you know, he's, he's some deeper life guy. Rather that he has seen that God is faithful in his word. And so, so that is probably the best quote that I could give you. Christ, God gave the richest jewel in his cabinet. Heaven isn't so precious as Christ himself beautiful words and i think those are fitting words last words for today so thank you so much for listening as always we encourage you to interact with us online please hit like share on facebook spread the word about itunes google play music podbean we'd love to connect with you let us know you're listening and we pray you have a wonderful day so thanks for listening to the service